when I started cycling, of course, you had to win races to be detected. Be in the right place at the right time with the right legs. The power meter uh, changed the complete game in cycling. The process of talent detection, it just all changed. 2016, they told me that they were going to try and host a global cycling talent ID competition. Canyon SRAM came onto the scene. It still is a super opportunity for young riders that maybe want a different path to becoming pro. Well, next year I'm going to be professional cycling. It's truly revolutionized a sport that desperately needs it. To find your way through to to professional career as a youngster when back in my day, it was more a question of just get out there, race your bike. Um, you had to get in front of scouts and so on. Back in the day, the pathway was a relatively simple one. It was club, regional, national team, and then you'd have the opportunity to perform in the biggest race in the world as an under 23 or as an amateur. So you sort of um, went through your junior years and then you had a couple of years as in the elite category. And it was just a question of being in the right place at the right time with the right legs and for the teams to be looking for your type of rider. And then that would be your pathway to turning pro. And then through that, you've got the stagiaire system, which is basically talent is identified and they're taken Generally in August, and as we all know, this is happening with younger and younger riders now, both across men's and women's, um, straight from the juniors now, is common, straight to World Tour. That was utterly unheard of 20, 30 years ago, even 10 years ago, really. As a wrong rider, I was doing uh, all kinds of races, like um, local races, like Kermes, like we said, uh, national races or international races. And uh, yeah, I remember it was... Uh, yeah, a lot of time when I was with the national teams, uh, even uh, a coach from other countries were coming to already speak to me. I was able to buy myself a ticket to South Africa for a sort of a pro-am race down there. Like I said, right legs at the right time with the right people watching and that race in South Africa for me was very much that particular moment. I had the boss uh, and the owner of the uh, of Colstrop, the sponsor, um, basically come in and said, have you thought about turning professional? And I said to them, just show me where to sign and I'll be there. For my first contract as a pro, I decided to race for France, for Francaise des Jeux. Um, the reason was um, to avoid a little bit the, the pressure of the media. Uh, we know that uh, Belgian media are quite hard on uh, young riders. Domestic British teams wanted me to ride for them but I chose to go and race in France as an amateur, living in a service course, which was a converted police station. And I was in the best team in France, did the Olympics and wasn't coached. But ultimately, I didn't turn pro till I was 30. Well, in women's cycling, it was really different in comparison to the men's because there simply weren't those big professional teams. There was maybe one one or two pro teams. And the other riders would ride for club teams that would not provide them much other than bicycles and very low salaries or non-salaries. We were also trying to juggle it alongside either a part-time job, some were, were full-time uh, jobs. I kind of gave up on the sport in terms of, of competition. I decided to get back to work because it didn't feel like a viable career path because it was such slim pickings in terms of the opportunities to be seen by those top teams. I think for women's cycling, it was definitely a lot more challenges because there, there was, at the time, there wasn't the money available. And, you know, it was even professional uh, women's cycling was still only the very, very, very best that, that got paid anywhere near enough to potentially break even or, or maybe make a, a living out of it. Traditionally, to get noticed, you had to be seen in races. But for some particular countries, that's certainly a lot harder. 
pro cycling mostly takes place in Europe. And if you cannot get there, if you cannot be seen by, you know, the, the decision makers, it's really hard to find your way to Europe. I think for most of the countries like Australia and America, they would have found it even more difficult. They would have had to go through potentially the national team path to get maybe a, a few races in in Europe in front of the right crowds. Everyone wants to race in Europe and so all the logistical challenges that come with that, whether that be visas or spending a long time away from home, you know, as we say, from Australia and America, you're, you're pretty much on the other side of the world, a long way from home and often speaking different languages. Those guys, they come for eight to ten months to Europe they have uh, an extra motivation because they left everything behind them to succeed in cycling. They didn't have any hobby, only cycling and uh, eating what they could and, and, and just sleep, you know, so and repeat every day. So sometimes it explains also why they are, they are better. Cycling has changed over the last 20 years. It's a lot faster today. The teams are more professional. They have more support, they have more uh, science, better material. When I started uh, as a pro uh, in Fosses de Jure, we were, I think, if I remember well, 19 riders. But today it's uh, mostly 27, 26 riders by team. But it means that uh, you race on uh, three schedules, so sometimes three races in the same weekend or on the same week. Wow, well, it's, it's a big change from from the moment I started in 2014. The Women's World Tour in just in the last few years has developed kind of beyond recognition almost. There's so much growth right now. Uh, the calendar is much bigger. The teams are much deeper. Each year we were getting more important iconic races, which also attracted more sponsors. In 2023, we had a massive increase in the number of race days. So we went up to, uh, I think it was 88 race days that were planned uh, in the Women's World Tour, which was almost 20 more than there was in previous years. And of course, having Tour de France Femme Avec Zwift, all of a sudden like created this like a huge passion and love for women's cycling. And that means that there's a lot of new opportunities for riders to come into the scene. There's more spots. Teams are now fielding two squads throughout the season, which is incredibly important. There was a point where we were starting to think, you know, are there enough riders that are necessarily going to be able to meet those demands of the World Tour? The minimum salary in the World Tour has totally changed the game. I think young, uh, talented riders um, can sort of see women cycling as a proper career choice. Bigger team teams, more riders, essentially a deeper talent pool, we had to find another way of recognizing and finding new talent. And that's when the revolution of data happened. The power meter uh, changed the complete game in cycling. I think it was 2010, 2015, and from then on, it all changed. The, the process of talent detection, the, the process of, of coaching, of following up, it just all changed. We had some kind of objective thing to measure the performance. So over time, you just had these extra layers of data, at which basically, um, then with the advent of the internet, this open source information that everybody had access to at a very low price point, suddenly, everybody could train like the best funded elite athletes in the world. The power meter just gave us a constant flow of, uh, of information actually uh, on each hour of training, on each hour of racing. So yeah, that was a big game changer. Before signing a rider, you ask him the password of his uh, database and uh, you just go analyze all his training and his races and, uh, and you see uh, his real potential. So it's easier today for the, for the teams to detect the, the real talent. You cannot uh, underestimate it or ignore uh, data anymore. As we see now, how which riders go to which races, 
it's extremely important to, to put the right rider on the right race on the right moment. Otherwise, uh, it's almost impossible to be successful. I think now we've got a, a wealth of uh, options for us to choose from in terms of how we can look at the potential of riders. So we're not just reliant on you know, looking at race results and being able to try and compare a race in one country to another. A complete power profile is um, like the physiological um, traits that, that you need to be successful in women's cycling. So ideally, you know, um, a relatively good sprint, um, good, you know, short power, one minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, um, half an hour. A modern world tour cyclist, what is needed to, to be at that level, producing one hour, five watts a kilo, that is not that big anymore in, in world tour cycling. So then the question is, okay, what kind of specific things are we looking for in some kind of athletes to make the difference? And it didn't take too long to discover that you could find a pathway to the pros using data alone. Let's go back to 2016. Uh, I had recently met the people from Zwift, and then they told me that they were gonna try and host a global cycling talent ID competition in their video game, and they were gonna do it with a women's team. It was a women's only, um, and they signed up for Zwift Academy, and they had to do like a series of like over 25 workouts in, in three months. By the end of it, 1,100 women had joined the program. Canyon SRAM came onto the scene. And this team, um, they approached us and were interested in doing some sort of talent ID through the video game. And we had already been thinking uh, about a project like this because of GT Academy, which was Nissan and PlayStation's game in um, Gran Turismo to win a real life driving opportunity. They were looking to do things differently. The idea was not only to have another cycling team, but we also be try to be disruptive to a very traditional sport. We've tried to yeah, bring some modern components into it. It was so successful that first year in terms of, um, you know, really creating an exciting new pathway to the pros, getting a ton of media attention. So the next year, because of all that media attention, uh, the Academy, I believe, doubled in size. We had about 2,500 women. It was definitely a success from the start, but the amount of people who were very critical about this concept at the very beginning was um, was interesting. And in 2017, when the men's one came online, it was generally these were just riders that were racing on Zwift. And as it got more popular, and the profile of the Zwift Academy got bigger, there were riders that were looking at it and thinking, wow, I can get, so I can get on the development team of World Tour team. Every year, the, the, the competitors becoming stronger and have, have a new level as they understand this is a, very honest pathway to get into professional cycling. It's pretty much grown to the point where this past year, I believe we had over 160,000 across the men's and women's programs. I think we've got a brilliant opportunity to, to find a real talent in there, looking at the physical capabilities of the rider. And then when we can finally meet them and, and whittle it down, we can fine tune the, the other aspects as well. But I think it provides such a, a vast scope of riders that we could try and tap into. As a talent scout, you can only be at one place at the same time. You can check one race and that's it. It's some, something like Zwift. I sometimes dream of that uh, if my computer would be uh, constantly connected to each Zwift rider in the world when he does something a five or a ten minute power outcome that is yeah something that I need to know that my that my computer just gives some kind of pop-up that would be uh, that would be great essentially Zwift given its reach is basically casting this enormous net um, with a certain set of prerequisites and just bring it in and it's basically cast over the entire world.
on a certain moment when the opportunity came to have F Swift as a partner, we were immediately happy, to be honest. And then, of course, uh, Jay Vine came. Jay Vine won the Swift Academy in 20, I guess. And it seemed to be that uh, it was uh, the tool to find uh, the right rider on the right moment. The Swift Academy offers a massive platform for riders who feel that they maybe haven't got spotted and maybe haven't got seen by any of the scouts or had the opportunity, the fund available. Maybe that's the, the, the big challenge right now, especially for, for the coaches who are going through all of the data that's coming there is to, to not miss that one little nugget, um, you know, that, that comes through the, the, the program that maybe isn't the rider that you're looking for, but could potentially turn out to be that next superstar. It still is a super, super nice opportunity for young riders that maybe want a different path to becoming pro. Um, it's quite unusual, but I think the past already showed that there are some really good riders uh, coming from it as well. We can see a lot of riders coming from Zwift that they're there in the final. They can fight for the the World Tour victories or World Tour podiums, not only in a women's cycling, but also in men's cycling. The hidden gem. I hope it's, I hope it's not hidden. I hope it's just not known to us yet. They want a certain sort of rider. So year on year, the, the process that riders go through to get to the final will, will actually shift and change according to the sort of rider they want on their roster. One year they might want a ruler and a sprinter, another year they want a climber. It's a big game changer or a life changer for a lot of people. And of course, it's also all, all, all or nothing and only one, uh, one athlete can uh, succeed. Hi, my name's Alex um, and I won Zwift Academy in 2022. It was last year that I completed the Zwift Academy workouts. So I moved back from uni to live back with my mum. So I completed them back in the shed down the end of the garden, <laughs> giving it everything. Um, and then it soon really quickly progressed. Like a few weeks later, I was out in Spain competing at the Zwift Academy finals. So it was a bit of a whirlwind experience, but yeah, something I will won't ever regret doing. Alex, congratulations! <laughs> when I was announced that I was the winner, I was, yeah, just over the moon. I couldn't really, couldn't really come to terms with it for quite a long time. I was just thinking about, well, next year I'm going to be a professional cyclist. Like, how, how cool is that? My name is Ella Harris. I am 25 years old. I'm from Dunedin, which is in the South Island of New Zealand. And at the time of doing the Zwift Academy, I was almost at a crossroads. I wanted to go to Europe to race because I knew Europe was the pinnacle of professional cycling. The selection process, going through the Zwift Academy from the uh, preliminary rounds, then to the semi-finals, then to the finals at the team camp in Malaga. It, to be there was incredible and then to be announced as the winner was a weight lifted off my shoulders because I came to want the ultimate prize a lot. Going to the Zwift Academy finals was my first time in Europe so then I went back home, I decompressed a little bit and then it was like wow I'm about to start a new life. In 2020 we were in quite a harsh lockdown in Melbourne and then one of my friends su suggested that I do Zwift Academy, so I tried it out, gave it a go. When I was doing the workouts, I was at uni, um, but all online, so it was quite easy to work around that. And just working at a local supermarket and living with my parents and riding as much as I could. It was really big because I had always wanted to become a professional cyclist. And then all of a sudden this opportunity came about and it was a pretty big shock. Being 18 years old and having to move over the other side of the world. It, it was summer. Uh, I was probably at my grandmother's house in, uh, in the mountains in Italy. At that moment probably I gave up uh, the pro cycling uh, dream, let's say. I knew about Zwift Academy, but uh, it was, in my mind it was something really far and not realistic. 
but I thought, yeah, we, we can try this year. And actually it worked out pretty well. So next year I'm joining the World Tour. And so I, I reached my, uh, the goal I had since I was uh, just a kid. When I won Zwift Academy, my life changed completely in probably one month. Of course, we heard uh, these, these voices, uh, people were skeptic about it. Um, and I think it's rather logical. And we cannot ignore the fact that Jay Vine shows incredible numbers. He was wearing the polka dot jersey in, in the Vuelta. He won a stage there. Um, he did other nice things, but still he struggles with uh, staying on the bike from time to time. It's one thing to be in your garage or basement you know, giving it everything you got when you can, you can absolutely fall over your bike and no, there's no consequences. But now you're in a pack next to some of the best riders in the world. The cameras are on you, the pressure is on. You see a lot more about the, the full potential of the rider and what they can handle and it's tough. You can detect a rider that is like as strong as we never saw. We don't have a guarantee that he's gonna win uh, the Tour de France because to win a Tour de France, you have to be with the best on the flat stage, avoid the crashes, uh, be in good position at the bottom of the climb. There is you know, another element of bike racing, and it's not just the pure power, is how you're able to, to read the bike race, position yourself in the bunch, how you handle the bike, yeah, and, you know, the awareness that you have and, and the intelligence that you have on, on, a, on a bike. The positioning is super important and then you really have to be, uh, be uh, confident on the bike. Um, I think nowadays just putting on a rain jacket and everything is, is quite okay. Everybody can do it, but for sure it's really difficult to be in the right spot at the right moment. I think Jay Vine is a good example. It took us two years to make him a real road cyclist. We were 100% sure that he had the numbers. And then the thing is, okay, how can we transfer this into a real uh, road cyclist who can also yeah, have all the other uh, skills that you need? The first race was pretty scary. I decided to change my brakes to European brakes because I had Aussie brakes, which are front, right and left, back. And I remember just like skidding everywhere because I wasn't used to it. So that was quite scary. Um, and I just remember the pure numbers, like thinking I was moving to the front and looking back and being like at the back again. I didn't feel like I was really lacking the legs. It was just being able to position and read the race. To the first race, uh, there was a lot of stress in me. One thing is like doing Zwift workouts uh, and winning Zwift Academy. Another thing is to race uh, with other uh, 200 guys that are as good as you and probably even better. I didn't really know how to conduct myself as a professional athlete and looking after those marginal gains and making sure that I was doing everything right from nutrition, lifestyle, sleep, just going about regular things at a race. It's not just about can you ride on a, like ride strong on a bike like you can on Zwift. <laughs> There's so many more aspects to it that you don't ever get to see if you just watch a cycling race, like the whole aspects of like training effectively. Uh, at races, you have to work with so many different people like the soigneurs and the mechanics and the sports directors and having meetings before races. I think there probably are more routes into the professional peloton now, but you have to be better to make that initial step, I think. Zwift is a great uh, platform to be used uh, as talent ID, um, especially in countries outside of Europe where it's really difficult uh, for them you know, to be noticed. It's truly revolutionized a sport that desperately needs it. Cycling has been done one way for a very long time, and that's kept a lot of talent out of the sport. So anything we can all do to create new pathways, to create new opportunities for riders to show what they're made of, to really, to see how far they want to take it and to really be able to chase their bike dreams. 
for men's and women's cycling, the Zwift Academy has become a real legitimate way to aim for a professional contract if you want to make it to the top of the sport. The Zwift Academy is a proven success and again this year 100,000 people have started that journey. We've got six finalists but there can only be two winners.